Good afternoon, good evening, good morning viewers, wherever you are located. It's a pleasure to have you join us for our second book talk of Pawns and Players by Kinyanjui Kombaini in our ongoing African literature series. This webinar will be recorded and can be accessed on our YouTube page, as well as on our website under videos in the coming week. To ensure your safety, some features have been disabled, this being audio and video sharing, as well as screen share. You're welcome to submit your questions using the Q&A feature at the bottom of your screen. The moderator will tackle your questions at the end of the session. For more engaging programs, please subscribe to our mailing list by visiting our Contact Us page on our website, globalcenters.colombia.edu forward slash Nairobi. I would now like to hand over to our director, Dr. Murugi Dirango, to make the welcome remarks. Dr. Dirango. Thank you very much, Pauline. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to our global audience and welcome. My name is Murugi Dirango, Director of Columbia Global Centers Nairobi. Uh, CGC Nairobi is one of nine centers across the globe established by Columbia universities to create opportunities for shared learning and to deepen the nature of global dialogue. Today, we are delighted to host the second in a series of virtual book talks featuring African authors. With this series, we hope to offer a platform where African writers can engage a global audience, offering not just their work, but exciting perspectives on how personal, political, and cultural experiences drive their storytelling. Today's talk will feature Kenyanjui Kombani author of the novel of Pawns and Players and moderated by Dr. Mshai Mwangoda. Kinyanjui Kombani, uh, otherwise known as the banker who writes, is an award-winning creative writer, banker, and learning solution specialist. His novels, The Last Villains of Molo and The Den of Iniquities have been studied texts in universities in Kenya and beyond. His total body of work includes 13 solo publications, children's stories, young adult fiction, and a play, Carcasses, that was shot to film in 2004 as Mizoga, <clears throat> as well as eight collaborations, including the newly released Nairobi Noir Anthology. In 2019, Kombani won both the, John, uh, the Jomo Kenyatta and Wahome Mutahi prizes for literature. He's also the 2018 winner of the Cord Bart Awards for African Young Adult Literature. He received the Outstanding Young Alumni Award of Kenyatta University <clears throat> in 2014 and featured in the 2015, 2040 under 40 men business daily Africa survey for his contribution to creative writing in the country. He is the group lead people capacity for Standard Chartered Bank, taking care of learning and development across the bank's retail banking footprint globally. Mshai Mongola is an, orator, an oratorist, a performer, scholar who uses the lens of culture in our work as an academic artist and activist. She holds a doctorate in performance studies from the Northwestern University in the US, a master's of creative arts from the University of Melbourne in Australia, and a bachelor of education from Kenyatta University. And may I say uh, that uh, Dr. Mwangola, our author and uh, honored guest, uh, uh, Kenyanju Kombani and myself are all alums of Kenyatta University. So we are all represented today. Mwangola chairs the board of Oraya Trust, which is the biggest non-state facilitator of civic education in Kenya, a member of the executive committee of the Council of, the, of Development of Social Science Research in Africa, CODESRIA. She is also a founder member of the intellectual collectives, the Elephant and the Orochua Collective. Uh, through the latter's activist arm, the performance collective, she, she co-facilitates uh, the monthly 
Point Zero Book Cafe, which features public performances and conversations around literature. Let me now invite Mshai to introduce Kinyanjui, uh, to, to uh, begin the discussion with Kinyanjui Kombani. Welcome, Dr. Mongola. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Ndirangu. And indeed, it is such a pleasure to be, uh, have the privilege again of hosting this second uh, book conversation with Kinyanji Kombani, who is absolutely one of my favorite writers. And you're soon going to discover exactly why. In fact, without um, wasting any time, why don't I just give you a taster of the beginning of the book that we'll be looking at in much more detail today after our first conversation, just finding out a little bit much uh, more about Kinyanjui. So these are the literally like two minutes, two and a half minutes, right at the beginning of his book of pawns and players. Smack. It catches me by surprise. Three seconds to be exact. One second, I'm admiring the sleek, brilliant white Mercedes Benz parked across the road. The next second, a shadow crosses my path. The third second, I am flying in the air. The jab has got me in the eye. I feel a spasm of pain through my body as I fall. It is impossible to be hit in the eye. When you hear people talking about being hit in the eye, they are talking about the eye socket. Most people do not get hit in the eye. When something is about to hit your eye, your reflexes swing into action. You either shut your eye or duck such that the blow hits your socket. When you are hit in the eye, your hands do not reach out to break your fall. They reach for the eye in an effort to stop the pain and you end up falling like a sack of charcoal. As I land in the mud-filled ditch behind me, I see what we grew up calling Esiorori. There's no direct translation for Esiorori. It's just Esiorori. Many circles of different sizes and colors merging into one another. From the open eye, I can see the towering figure of the person who hit me. With a clean sweep, he sends everything in front of me scattering. There is rage in his eyes. Why has the man from the Mercedes Benz hit me in the eye? I ask myself. I am a good, honest individual trying to make a living in Kiamatawa. It is said that Kiamatawa means city of lights, <laughs> which is ironic because there are very few working street lights here. I am also a law abiding citizen who pays his taxes. Whenever I buy something from the supermarket, I see the abbreviation V-A-T on my receipt, value added tax. So yes, I pay my taxes. It takes a minute for the pain to subside enough for me to squint and find out who the attacker is, or at least what is happening. I can picture two scenarios and both of them include Kaanjo, the county police. On one hand, it could be an unfriendly Kanjo in the first stage of arresting me. On the other hand, it could be a friendly one pretending to be angry in the presence of his colleagues because he does not want them to know that he has received something small from the traders. Well, it is neither. When I ask, when I see who it is, a loud gasp escapes from my mouth. The man standing with arms akimbo, tie fluttering in the wind, flanked by two muscular bodyguards, is no Kanjo. I wish it were the Kanjo. I know how to handle them. I realize I am in one of those places my friend Elisha calls hard, small, between a rock and a hard place. Kinyanji Kombani, you know, once somebody starts that, you can't put the book down. <laughs> and I think that's your genius. So welcome, welcome to this discussion. I am thank you, so thank you for having me. Yeah. I, there are very few books, you know, I, I said, okay, I, I do like um, 
thinking about a book by thinking about what people are doing in the first two, the first two minutes, the first three minutes, how you grab, but you have a gift. Once I read those two, I knew that was it. I was sitting in that same chair till the book was over. So thank you very much for the gift of your writing. And we'll come back and discuss of pawns and players and that explosive beginning. But before we do that, I want to find out a little bit about Kenya and Kombani. May we do that? Yes, yes, yes. And thank you for having me. Kinyanjui, you are a prolific writer who works in many, many genres. And you started writing early, as Dr. Ndirangu said. Uh, we are, three of us are all alumni from Kenyatta University. And you began writing when you were at the university. And I see that um, you are a comic book writer. This is something I didn't know until I was preparing for this. Tell me a little bit about that. Do you draw yeah, and write? I, just write? Yeah, I actually used to draw. I used to draw. I started off by being a comic book artist so i used to i used to draw comics i had a character that was inspired by frank odoi you know the cartoonist who passed on and uh, paul kelemba so i used to have my own my own i used to have my own comic series modeled after my name very nice adventure story all through all through school uh, i only started writing fiction in in campus and i actually even used to draw you know the way we have all these christmas decorations in nairobi shops so there's a time I actually used to go to Nairobi with my with my rucksack full of you know full of um, uh, watercolors to just to paint as well. So I used to be an artist in my other life. Yeah. So where we see like you know the Christmas tree and stuff on shop windows, you know. Okay, yes, so that's yeah, interesting that, because yeah. one of the things I'm going to say about your writing that I find interesting is how visual it is. So that that really makes sense. And then um, when you were at university, I know you you did a, a play that was yeah. um, got a lot of attention. I think it traveled both in and out of the country. And then it got turned into a, a film and you are the screenwriter. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, so we, so we were commissioned to do a play about uh, the bushmeat trade. That's the time that you had a lot of uh, issues with bushmeat and uh, it was actually a big issue. So the Bone Free Foundation asked us if we could do a story for, uh, for them that could be turned into a play. Uh, we did the play, we went around the country with it and then they felt that because the issue of blue bush meat is not just in Kenya, it is global, they decided to now turn it into a film. So you went to Taita, a place called Kasigao, and shot the film there. It's now, it was produced by Bone Free Foundation, and um, the director was Martin Monua, who is a Kenyan director. And also, uh, the other, the assistant director, interestingly, was uh, Tosh, Tosh Itonga, who, who is uh, also known for Nairobi Half-Life. So we, yeah. we became friends that time, yeah, yeah. That was in 2005, 2004, 2005, yeah. And did you find the transition from, you know, writing for a comic book to writing for essentially drama, whether it was on the stage or on film, did you find that to be difficult or it's something that just came to you? I think it's, there's a very big, there's a very big similarity between those three. And the similarity is the visual, the visualness, if I can use it that, the visualness of it all, where you can, you, you need to visualize whatever you are, if you're writing something on paper, if you are, you need to visualize it in your mind first. And the same thing, uh, because I also did theater in, 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 camp, in campuses, you, 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 whatever you're doing, you're actually seeing it on stage first. And that helped me a bit in terms of when I'm now writing fiction, I have to, first of all, try and be the person like when i was researching for of pawns and players i had to sit next to a person who does motura uh, who sells motura on the roadside to really understand what does he see what is his his what is his uh his angle what does what is his 360 degrees look like and that's that informed my writing so that i think the biggest thing is not a difference actually the biggest thing is the similarities in the in in the fact that you have to visualize everything before you actually start writing yeah. And something else that then also comes through is that you also, uh, you're writing, and we'll, we'll look at this in detail with um, of pawns and players, but your writing is also pretty fast paced, that, you know, you've, you've got this sense that, you know, your, your writers do not stop and contemplate the universe and spend two or yes. three pages describing the scene. Everything is action, action, action. And so that really does come through from there. Yes, yes. Um, yeah, yeah. yeah. 
you're also really well known, especially, um, and, and, and uh, Dr. Ndirango mentioned that. I'm gonna come to the novels because I think that's, um, I think there's an interesting way in which one novel in a sense leads to the other novel. And I want us to come through with that as we go into for, of pawns and players. But something else that, and I think many, many people, especially outside Kenya might know you for, is your young adult books. And um, especially, uh, I know that you won, and was said, you won the Bert Award in uh, 2018. And then you also won and, um, the Jomo Kenyatta Award in the English Youth category the following year. Could you tell us a little bit about your writing, why you think it's important to write for young adults? Because for many people who found success writing for adults, um, that's a, that I think is a different market and takes a different kind of writing. So why young adults? Yeah. Tell us a little yeah. bit about the books that you, you've written for that particular yeah, so market. Movement, yeah, so my movement to young adult and children writing was uh, when I started having challenges with piracy in Kenya. Mm -hmm. And I figured that uh, uh, issues with piracy will not end anytime soon. And, and I could see that people are really photocopying uh, novels and things like that but they're not photocopying children's books. So I said, if you want to succeed as a writer, then you might as well start with uh, children's books. And then, uh, and then I found myself moving towards young adults because I also feel that for us to build a reading culture in Africa or in Kenya, we need to start with people who are a bit younger. We, we talk about the poor reading culture in Kenya, but I think it's because you're focusing on the wrong people. Maybe our generation, we, we're already too, too far gone. But if you start with people who are now getting there, they don't have they don't have a lot of books that are Kenyan that talk about Kenyan Kenyan issues. Uh, because even me when I was growing up, I was reading a lot of um, uh, Hardy Boys, uh, Nancy Drew, things that are which are good stories. But in terms of our context, I didn't have a lot to 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 read out of our own about our own stories. So that was my next thing is that I decided that I want to write something that our my 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 children can look up to and can read that will tell them about issues that are happening in the society right now. So that was my next movement. Uh, and, I, and I find myself actually moving between the three, uh, the three, either young adult, children's, and, 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 uh, and adult fiction. I, I move seamlessly around the three, yeah. What, what are the books that you've written for children and for young adults? So for young adults, I wrote uh, I wrote a book called Imani and the Missing Miss, which is a great great story. Only that it's, it didn't win an award, but it's a, it's a I, I, actually it's my favorite story. Uh, ah. Then I wrote uh, Finding Colombia, which was about the drugs issue. Um, it was an adventure story, uh, Finding Colombia, and then uh, and then I also wrote Do or Do. Do or Do is another story that I incidentally I was going to research for my story in Nairobi Noah. My story in Nairobi Noah is based on, is based on, uh, on Dandora and it's based about, you know, talking about police brutality. So when I went there to research for it, I actually came out of there with two stories. One story was about football and the other story was about, was now about, um, about the issue of police brutality. So I figured that it's two, two, those are two deep themes. I might as well just have two stories. So I came out of, Dandora with two stories, and that's, that was the part of it. I also did another story called um, called Eve's Invention. Uh, another, again, another. I think I like the characters. The the stories where the characters are girls, because even Eve's Invention is a very nice story about a girl who who investigates, who invents a machine that can stop. There's there's a there's an infestor, infestation of some worms. It's called strangleworm in the country, and now the girl invents a machine that is able to kill the worms without having any side effects. Uh, oh. Interestingly, when I was writing it, just when we were about to publish, there was a worm infection in Kenya around that time in 20, 2018, 2019. So it, it kind of looked like it was reaction to what's happening, but actually it was one of those things that happened before. Uh, for children, I have done a book for yeah, very young children below five years. It's, a, it's more of a picture book. Uh, that talks about uh, safety. I've done a book about HIV AIDS called We Can Be Friends, which was done for the Uganda market and also for the Rwanda market. So there are, there are, there are two editions. And I did, um, and I also worked with the Kenya Yearbook, Kenya Yearbook um, uh, editorial uh, group. You know, the Kenya Yearbook is a very big book 
that talks about Kenya. It's, it's a very uh, bulky book with a lot of facts and figures. So we worked with the Kenya Book uh, Committee to see if you can make children's editions of the same Kenya book. So the result of that was a series of six books that are now available for children, including a picture book that's available under, under the series. Yeah. So I didn't that know. makes the bulk of you also have a book on Mangari Magali, if I'm not wrong. Yes, again, I forgot, sorry, I forgot about I also did a, a children's biography on Mangari Magali. Um, I think I'm getting old because I'm also forgetting some of the books. Uh, in 2007, I wrote a story about Mangari Magali, which was more of an of a children's adventure story that that kind of, it was more about conservation based on the ideals of Mangari Magali and also bringing her story. She just won the Nobel Prize. And that's when that's when I wrote this. It was a, it's it's a nice uh, kind of Alice in Wonderland kind of story. Yeah. So something I find interesting about even as you talk about your books and books for children, first of all, is your your emphasis on books are about a social issue, and you're one of these writers who is able to tell, you know, some people talk about social issues and you're like, okay, 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 I've had enough. That's propaganda. But you've got the gift of being able to tackle an issue and yet do it in a very, very entertaining way. And we see that right through your work from, we've talked about the dramatic, the drama, but then you've also talked about it with the children's books. And the other thing I think that's really interesting is you very much write for the Kenyan, you, you're thinking about Kenyan audiences, but from the fact that you won um, the, the better word for finding Colombia, it's clear that even though you're saying this is the market that I'm looking at, these are the audience, these are the people I see myself writing for, your book does have appeal far beyond uh, the borders of Kenya. And I know when we talk about your novels, which I want us to just um, briefly talk about next, mm -hmm. your books yeah. are not only being studied in universities in Kenya, but they've also found success in other spaces. I know I, know I saw that you know, um, one of them is being studied, um, has, been, has been taught in Berlin, for example, in Germany. Yeah, yeah. So I think that's something that I find really interesting about your work, that it's, it's both entertaining, but it also comes and engages with social issues in a way that people of different ages are able, are able to really um, grasp. Why yeah, don't we talk yeah, about that's, your yeah, that, that's some, yeah, that's something I was, I'm also trying to uh, think a lot because some of these issues are not just Kenyan issues. So the story might be Kenyan, but the whole, the fundamentals of the story actually the same way we associate with uh, with uh, Chinua Achebe's work, uh, Things Fall Apart, is that you could actually see if things fall apart in, in Kenya, you can actually see, that's, that's, that's the kind of thing that I'm also talking about, yeah. For many adults, I think you're best known for your two novels, um, Last Villains of Molo and Den of Iniquities, um, before we come to Of Pawns and Players, which is mentioned. Could you tell us a little bit uh, more about that? I was very happy when I read the, to, you know, and, and I know you talk about this, but also I can see you thank him in, in, in your acknowledgments in, of Pawns and Players, that your teacher and my teacher who mentored both of us, David Keep Writing Mulwa, is the one who set yeah. you off on the path of publishing novels. Could you tell us a little bit about Last Villain of Molo, how that came about, yeah. what it was about? So that Last Villain of Molo, yeah. So Last Villain of Molo was written in 2002, and it was about the clashes that were in Molo in 1992. So most people know uh, when they hear about post-election violence, they think that the 2007 clashes were the worst because we, it was all over the country and all that. But the 1992 clashes were more. More people died in, in, in Molo, more people were displaced. There's been lasting uh, challenges even now. And that was what I set out to do. So I started, first of all, to do a short story about uh, the clashes in Molo. And then it ended up becoming a novel when I did more research uh, about it. Uh, when I wrote it, I wrote it, it was a handwritten piece. We didn't have a lot of computers then. I gave it to my lecturer, David Mulwa, and David Mulwa, his, his comment was, this is the masterpiece. Oh. Have it typed and submit to a publisher for public, for immediate publication. So that was his, and that's, and he's always been pushing me, even when I, when I have a new book and I give it to him uh, as a gift, he will accept it and tell me, thank you so much. What are you writing next? He's always asking, you know, he's always telling me, keep writing. Uh, yeah. and, the, and he was concerned when I, when I joined the bank, because uh, he was asking me, is the bank going to take away from your writing? But I've proved him wrong because I, I still keep writing. Yeah, so that was my first book. Uh, it was written in 2002. 
uh, but it took about six years to get published. So it was released in 2008, right after the 07 clashes had happened. Uh, and then we moved to another, we moved to Longhorn Publishers in 2012. So I've seen its success has actually come when you actually moved to, uh, to Longhorn Publishers, because it was a bigger publisher with, with, uh, with a wider Africa-wide uh, reach. And we've been always, we've been having conversations around our film. Uh, we, we, the, the producer is looking for money right now because uh, they want to do the film exactly as it appears in the book, which means it's going to be war scene, you're going to burn villages. So the budget is a bit, is a bit, um, is a bit higher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. And then, um, so when I wrote The Last Villains of Molo, there was a lull in my writing. I didn't write anything else for a long time. First of all, because I had put all my, I had put everything in The Last Village of Molo because I thought it, I was going to be a one novel. I didn't know anything else I could write. Um, and then uh, in 2012, 2013, I started writing Den of Iniquities, which was actually a series of other stories that I put together and then I just expanded them to become a full novel because I had done some short stories. Uh, and and the reason is the reason I did that is because we don't have a lot of uh, a big market for short stories in in Kenya. The 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 publishers don't want um, don't want to publish a lot of they don't they don't want to publish a lot of anthologies by one writer. So they want to probably get many writers together. So I I couldn't get a market for my for my short stories. So I put them into a story uh story and then I I just made it longer. So Den of Iniquities is my second novel. Incidentally, uh, Pons and Place is not my third novel. It's my fourth novel. Yeah. My third novel is, is, is still the publishers. It's supposed to be released. I just signed it off for publication uh, a fix ago. So it's supposed to be released either towards the end of the year or early January. Yeah. So it's my fourth novel, yeah. We look forward to that. I know we are, I, I want us to move to of Pons and Players, but just very briefly, Den of Iniquities is set in Nairobi. Yes. And just tell me just one or two sentences. What is yeah. it about? So, so Den of Iniquities is about uh, extrajudicial killings. So I happen to have a friend of mine who, because his number, because so the police went and got one of the one robber and they, they asked him to, they checked his phone and everyone who he had called in the last, uh, in the last maybe three or four days, they rounded them up and they wanted to kill them all. Uh, so, so, uh, so my friend was very traumatized about that. And, and he told me about the story about how he had survived the police, um, the police uh, uh, extrajudicial killing. He had, the way he had survived because they were told to run, but he refused to run because he knew that if I run, they're going to shoot me in the back and they'll say that we ran. So he said, if you're going to shoot me, shoot me when I'm standing. And they, he, uh, he, he was just told to walk away. He walked away until he got to safety. Uh, but that became my inspiration for uh, for Den of Iniquities. And then I went to, again, I went to Dandora to, uh, I, I found a lot of stories of people who had actually been, you know, at least you know somebody who has been shot by police or somebody whose relative has been killed by police. And that actually inspires my story in Nairobi now as well, because that has been a recurring theme. Yeah. Mm. yeah, I was actually going to comment and say, um, so we talked about, we, we mentioned Nairobi Noir last in, in our last conversation, which has been edited by Peter Kimani, who was our guest. And your story was one of my absolute fa favorite stories. I don't really like noir as a genre because it's very, it just is, yeah, dark. it's very so. But dark, what yeah. I love about that story is that you, you, you've got a gift about, and I think we see it, you know, when you talk about Molo, Molo being this place in the Rift Valley in Kenya, that was the epicenter. People think of the epicenter of politically election related violence. And then you take us to Dandora in both Den of Iniquities and the story uh, uh, that you have um, um, the, 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 in, in, in Robinoa Andaki. And in it, you, you bring to life Dandora. And just as a way of moving into the novels, um, Peter Kimani on, in Nairobi Noir, when he's talking about what he sees as, as Nairobi, what, what's Noir? When you think about Nairobi, what, what, what does Noir um, talk about? He talks about inequality and the contrasts between that you see both visually, wealthy estates near, mm -hmm. next to informal settlements and low income um, residential estates, 
he talks about you know this this thing of where people who come from very wealthy backgrounds are, can can engage and meet in so many ways with people who come from the opposite he talks about police and of course that's a very current theme across the world with whole you know people talking about defund the police or just what happens with extrajudicial killings and police he talks about the use of um kenyan languages sheng and kenyan languages he talks about the issue of security and safety and people, what make, how, how, how are people secure and safe even in the places they call home? And then he talks about the question of identity. And you are one of, you are perhaps one of the maybe two or three writers who in their stories captured all of that. And so I found that absolutely fascinating. And I think that that's a good way also to bring us to of pawns and players because all of those things are what this novel is about. So as we go to of pawns and players, can I ask you, please, just give us another taste of the book before we talk a little bit more about it. Okay. Uh, would you like so I'll read. Another? Yeah. So uh, I'll, I'll I'll read from I'll read. Uh, the context here is that our character has just is has just, is just about to be announced that uh, he's the winner of uh, three million dollars. So so I'm just reading from there. Yeah. So. Walker steps out of the helicopter and the crowd goes wild when they see him. He waves at the crowd and everyone jostles to get a close glimpse of him. Someone tries to take a selfie with him in the background, but the phone is knocked from his hand. I wonder if he'll ever find anything left of the screen by the time he dives in to rescue it. Wallace is wearing a green and white outfit, the money bet brand colors. He still has his headsets on. Hello, hello, Wallace Bellows. His voice booms from speaking on the sides of the helicopter. When you see me here, you know how brought good things. You know what I mean, right? He says into the headset mouthpiece. Right, the crowd choruses back. The crowd has swollen so much that the road is blocked. The roar of the crowd drowns the hoots and curses of the drivers. Wallace snaps his fingers and the men in navy blue suits push people out of the way, creating a path. As Wallace walks straight at me, Elisha appears. He's zipping up his trousers. Uh, he has probably been interrupted by the commotion. They, they, they are coming this way, Elisha stammers. I suddenly realize that he's half laughing, half crying. He must be thinking he's the one who has won the jackpot. I wish I told him about the money bet plan. Wallace comes straight, straight to me. The crowd roars, pushing and shoving. The security men have a hard time keeping them a safe distance from the newscaster. Wallace does not just hug me, he holds me and does an awkward dance with me. Alicia is shocked. Umeshinda? He asks me. He says that I have won. When I nod, Alicia breaks into a dance. Tumeshinda! Tumeshinda! He shouts, jumping up and down. Then like a possessed man, he kicks and brings down my jiko in a crash. He joins us in the crazy dance. He does not stop shouting that we have won. Nobody's listening to him. They are in the air. Money, money, money. Someone bring me a bottle of water. Wallace's voice reverberates through the crowd and there's a hush. One of the guys throws him a bottle of mineral water. It is all a show because he does not even open it. Ladies and gentlemen, we have ourselves a winner. The crowd grows into a frenzy. Not experienced that much excitement in a long time. My man, tell us your name. He hands me a microphone. Winning the jackpot makes everything you say interesting. As soon as I say my name, the crowd erupts in laughter and claps. Man, how does it feel to be $3 million richer? I shake my head. I can't believe it. $3 million? What did he say? Elisha asks and then faints. Hey, that is my friend, I start. But Elisha is in safe hands. Three men lift him and take him to a shop. He recovers almost instantly and follows them into the crowd. $3 million? How much is that in shillings? Wallace exclaims. Some quick thinking shouts out the answer and the crowd roars in admiration and amazement. Another man alights from the helicopter carrying something rectangular wrapped in shiny foil. He has the money bet logo printed on it. He wades through the crowd and hands the package to Wallace, who dramatically rips the foil apart to display a dummy check. Mask Karamu, a sum of $3 million only. The crowd applauds. Only, only, $3 million only. I think for such a large amount of money, the check should not have the word only. How are you feeling, bro? Wallace asks. I don't know. I can't believe this, I say. 
Well, you better believe it, bro. $3 million is being transferred to your bank account as you speak. Whoa, the crowd erupts. Elisha is by my side. The way he's beaming with excitement, you would think that he's the one who has won. I pull him closer and wave the crowd with him. Wave to the crowd with him. $3 million? What can anybody possibly do with $3 million? Wallace asked the crowd. He's a master at dramatic exaggeration. His question elicits a number of responses from the crowd. And what will you do with $3 million? Wallace turns to me. I honestly don't know. I think I'll take a few weeks holiday. You sure must do that. He hands the dummy check over to me and then he addresses the crowd. This is just for the camera. So don't visit Thomas thinking he has the money. The money will be in the account. A few people get his joke and laugh. We then pose for photos with the dummy. Is that enough or should I go ahead That's one cool. more? Like you can do it. That's a good. Bit. Yeah. Let, 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 that gives us a good sense. What's happening? Okay. Who is Thomas? Yeah, so, 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 so the whole idea is that there is a man who sells motifs, a roadside dish um, uh, delicacy. Uh, uh, and then he, he gets, he gets uh, trapped in this uh, betting game where there's, some, there's a team of uh, entrepreneurs, or as we call them, entrepreneurs. Uh, or crooked businessmen who want him to be the front for, for his um, um, uh, for, for 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 the for the price they want him to be the front that is on the price so that mm -hmm. they can get much more business by more people betting. So he's just a front for them. So this is a place where now he is seated at his place and and they they come to tell him that he's won the price of three million dollars. And Elisha is his close friend. So. The story is actually Elisha's story. Because when I was, I was writing, I wanted Elisha. Elisha is actually the person who bets a lot. So Elisha is his friend. He's a cobbler uh, who, who's, who works next to him. And they've been talking about, you know, talking about life throughout the story. And this is when now Elisha discovers that his friend has won the, has won the jackpot of $3 million. Yeah. OK, and so just, just to, to take us back. So again, this is a very character driven um, story and you get it right from the beginning. Thomas is the one telling us and anybody who doesn't know what Mutura is, um, as he said, yeah. it's a Kenyan sausage. There's a great, great article um, that you can find called The Joy of Eating Mutura, Nairobi's Blood Sausage of Ill Repute um, that's been written by Kerry Baraka. So anyone wants to know what that's about, you can read and find out more. But not, you know, people who, it's street food that, you know, most people who are more affluent don't tend to eat. Right? Am I right on that? Um, at least they don't yes, eat it. Right. And then it's got they, a lovely. They, they, they do, but not. They do, but not in the in the place where my story was set. Yeah, you, they would actually yeah. eat, still eat it, but it would be very costly. Yes, and it wouldn't be on the street. It would probably be in some wouldn't big restaurant or yeah. hotel or home. And then he's got a love interest, who's this beautiful girl. Yeah. And yeah, tell me more about her. I always love the female characters well, of it. How does she yeah. come into the so story? They, so, so how she comes to the story is that she she comes one day and eats the mutura, and 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 as she goes she goes away. After two minutes, she comes back and she says she wants another piece because it was too sweet. And, and she suddenly clearly over, has not had it before. So she's never had mutura again. I mean, she's she enjoys. She becomes a very good customer of his. Mm -hmm. And then when she when when she you know she comes and even buys in bulk, like, you know, does a lot of things, she calls her friends. So it, she she becomes actually his biggest customer, uh, and that's when now it, it, a sort of relationship um, uh, evolves. But the challenge is that he's he's a bit too he's a bit too uh, too scared to ask her out. So it is Elisha who's been pushing him to you know ask out ask her out, uh, and it's been always been uh, chiding him, you know. If you, if a person who stays next to a beautiful girl without telling her, ends up fetching water for her during her wedding, so that's because that's, that's something. Because she comes from a very affluent family. Yes, because she comes again. She comes from a very affluent family, uh, but she there's actually a very good healthy relationship uh, between them uh, until now. The until uh, our guy discovers who the father is. Uh -huh. And, 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 and that's part of the fun about the story, um, linking, okay, so what does the beginning of the story, 
have to do with this middle part, the part where he gets beaten up and this middle part of the bet. Um, and then, you know, and, and what I find really interesting about, you know, actually when I was, that whole first part, I was hearing, you know, this song Malaika, Nakupenda Malaika mm. and this whole thing of this poor man. And I thought, okay, I know where this story is going. They're gonna fall in love and then one of them is gonna get killed or something like that because I expect from your writing, you've tended to be a very somber writer. I, I really thought things were going to go down south. And then you, there's a twist in the story that has to do about betting. So um, betting, Alicia bets, why is betting such a big part of the story? Uh, yeah, because when I was doing my research, I, 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 and, and that's why I wrote the story. So the, the, I wrote the story because uh, one of, because it, cause I wrote it specifically so that I can submit it for the Wahama Mutahi Prize. And when I was submitting, one of the things that I wanted to do was to think about what does Wahama Mutahi, what did he stand for? Because he was a famous humor, um, humor writer. What did he stand for? And he stood for everything so that he wrote. There was a very, writing. sorry? The prize for humor writing? Yes, he has the, the Wamutai Prize for humor. And, and because he all he whenever he wrote, he always had first of all he had humor in the story. The second thing is that there was always a message. There was always a message that he wants to put across. And the third thing is that he looked at the he looked at the characters to be as simple as possible. You are ordinary, uh, ordinary characters. He didn't try to you know complicate characters. So when I started writing, those were the things that actually I was thinking about in terms of. I'm going to use these three characters. And these characters are going to tell the story. And I'm going to look at the one thing that I was going to look at that is actually an issue was, was betting, because betting is a very big issue right now. Uh, a lot of people have lost money, um, uh, have lost li livelihoods. Um, in my industry itself, not, not my company, but it, the industry itself, we, we have we had cases of people who are actually bank, em bank employees taking their taking money that doesn't belong to them, it belongs to the bank or the customers and actually using that to bet and losing it all. So it's a lot of people have lost uh, relationships, livelihoods to betting. And the, the thing also is that when I was doing my research, I discovered that in the past, betting never used to be very mainstream. But now just on your phone, you can download all those betting apps and you can, you know, you can bet. I During my research, I lost a lot of money because I was betting on uh, football games. You can bet on football games that are happening in very many countries. You can even bet on dog races. You can, there's so much, you, know, you can bet 24 hours a day. So I, during my research, I actually lost a lot of money. I, I lost quite a bit of money. Yeah. Yeah. I hope so. I need to find out how, do, how does it really work. Yeah. Yeah. I hope the book sales have brought it back. And I think what's interesting is that you give us a look at the betting, the whole industry, the scams within it. Um, but also very powerfully about the people who are caught up in it. And it's the whole range yeah. for the, the, from the person uh, on one end who's taking everything he has, even what his family needs to bet um, yeah. from the way young people like students get caught up in it. But then all on the other side, you take us to the people who own the betting companies or who are the front, um, the faces of the betting companies. And I think it's, it's a really ingenious way how you do that in a short, in such a short story. Um, I also like, so you've, on the cover of the book, I don't always get thrilled by covers of the books, but I think on the cover of this book, one thing that is very interesting, and it links to the name of the book, of pawns and players, which made me think of yeah. chess. But then when I came into mm. the book, it's not about chess. Could you say a little bit about yeah. the title? And, and yeah. I love so the cover. Actually, that's, yeah. that, that's what everyone thinks. So everyone thinks it's about chess because they see a pawn there and, and also they see the king. Uh, so uh, the story about the title, we, we spent about a year looking for a title for this story. Because initially when I wrote it, the working title was Awful Man, because Awful is what he was selling. So it was Awful Man. And uh, conversation with one of my mentors, John C. B. Okumu, he was, he, he, one of the things that he told me, I love the story, I don't like the title. And we had a lot of debates around it and he kept telling me, you know, this title has to go. So we had a lot of mixed uh, uh, ideas. And then we sat down with the, we started on looking for, for titles. And then one day it just hit us. This character is a pawn. He's a pawn in the, in the story. Uh, all of us are pawns. And then we are all played. And that's when we came up with the idea of, of pawns and players. So you're all pawns. And then if you look at the cover, the, the pawn is facing off against the against the, the king and the shadow is actually the king. 
so you 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 so you you see the correlation that you the person you think is a pawn actually ends up being the king which is actually yeah. what appears with the story yeah 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 it's yeah. one of the so things it was a collaboration to... so the the the, the, the general was a collaboration of so many so many people I, and i i really appreciate what john cb okumu did because i don't think the book would have had as much success as it had if it was just called of all man yeah one thing I think it does that it makes you think about the first time I read it, I thought of him, Toma, as as the as as the pawn, right? And then here yeah. are people who are manipulating him. But then, on, when I was reading it for this, I realized everybody in that book is a pawn of somebody Every, else. Everybody is a pawn, and even the even even the even the the, the even the the boss himself is also a pawn. Yeah. He doesn't yeah. he doesn't own anything. He's also a pawn. So we are all pawns. We are thinking that we are players. And end up being the pawns. Yeah, and you also shine a light on. So I know you're a banker. Everybody talks about you as the banker who writes mm -hmm. books. But I was so conscious about the way you write about the banking world, and also police, which you always seem to come back to the police. But then also lawyers. Yeah, yeah. So it made me think about how professionals who we may think have their their lives all together, they know what they're doing. They are also pawns, and you know players. So it's yeah, really yeah. fascinating. Yeah. We are all pawns. We are all pawns in this game. <laughs> Yeah. Now the other thing that um, I think you 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 talk about really well is this question of, and I think it's Gugi Thiongo who talks about wabenzi, and it's it's an image that I think got lost at one point um, because as other cars came up, I think we lost the sense of wabenzi. But then the contrast mm. between on one hand wabenzi and on the other hand muturaman, I think is just genius. Could you just say a little bit about that, and then I'll go to some of the questions that we yeah. have. Why were being uh, yeah, and that and, and that's why when I was explaining it, it's, this has to be as uh, uh, on the other side of the road. First of all, the Mercedes Benz was parked on the other side of the road. That shows to show us the contrast contrast between our character and what he's seeing. Because the when I, the way I was looking at the story, I actually did most of the story from behind. Motura guys, what does this see? And you were actually seeing that, and that's why the, the, the base was the other side, and actually it was also very white. So again, mm -hmm. when you think about where he is, and then the whiteness is actually a very, it was actually just to contrast between the haves and the have nots. Uh, mm -hmm. And that's what I tried to, to bring about. And when he goes also to the also to the house, there's also another aspect of haves and have not. He actually, um, when he goes to visit the house, he actually says, this is like a hotel. Uh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. And all the time, because we get to go into Thomas' house and get a sense of that. Yes. And we get to go to the other, you know, literally <laughs> to see how the other half lives. And it's a completely yes. different school. Um, and, 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 and talking about and, and talking about Thomas, talking about Thomas' house, there's one thing also that I wanted to put across. You notice that when uh, when the girl went to Thomas' house, he was actually she was actually shocked that the house was very well organized and very clean. When I was, when I was, uh, I used to stay where there was a Mutura guy who actually I modeled the story after. And when I went to see him, I was very shocked because you expect it to be you no, know, in a, you know, very bad looking kind of situation. I, he had a bigger TV than I had and, and, and I was the banker here. And he, I discovered that he makes so much money from, from renting out those jikos. So actually that's something he does. He, he, he's, his motura is only one of his sources of income, but on a good day, he actually has four or five jikos, which he, he lends out to other people. So also trying to bust to bust the myths that we have that you know these guys, uh, they, 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 we are better off. We are we are to sell motura. Most cases, they are actually better off than we are. They make more money than we think. Yeah. And also, okay. you know, the fact that he's more ethical than a lot of the professionals that you find. I was just looking for the part in the book, um, and, and it's very interesting the way he, he asks her that, but it's a question to ask. When she goes into the house and she said, you thought that a Mutura man would live in a dungeon, you know, and, and that's the yeah. question that how we often do not, we see how he sees her house through his eyes, but often we don't look at it the other way and what that says about us. I want to go to yeah. a question. And, go ahead. Go ahead. Yeah, and, and even the way even the way we relate with each other, because it's a Mutura guy, for instance, they removed him from the from the from the estate WhatsApp group. Uh yeah. if you notice that story. They actually had removed him from the estate WhatsApp group because they didn't think that he was adding any value to 
to them. But when you won the $3 million, everyone was, you know, we want to add you back. And also, it's also the way we, as human beings, treat each other based on what value we can give each, we can, we can get from them, which is actually one of the things that I really try to, to highlight in the story. Yeah. Which is also what happens when he goes to the bank and the way, you know, people yes, treat again, people. Yeah when they think he's got $3 million and when he's just the guy who's got, you know, <laughs> barely has deposits. Dis disclaimer, that's not my bank. It was just another <laughs> bank. <laughs> I'm sure it's not. <laughs> so Antoine <laughs> is wondering, he says, thanks for the engaging words. Just a quick one, considering that you seem to have a clear view on the audience you want to reach, how did you choose the publishing houses you wanted to have your books or theater plays published in? You know, so in terms of, local, international. I know you started very much with the Kenyan audience, but then you are now getting more of a global audience. So what goes into choosing who publishes you? For me, for me, it's not even the publishing houses, it is the people. So I have built good relationships with the people who are in the publishing houses. So I know my main publishers are Longhorn and Oxford and they have, they have, uh, because they have presence in at least 10 or so countries in Africa. So I know that I have that kind of Africa reach. But most importantly for me is I know the publishing manager, I know the editor. We have we we have conversations with the editor about how do I improve my work on a daily basis. I know the illustrator, I know the marketing team. I, I have conversations. So for me, it's about the people and the relationship that I have within the publishing houses than even the name of the publishing house. Because those are the people who are good, if who are going to drive your sales. If you if if the if the salesperson does not know about a book called of Pons and Players. When he goes to a school and the school asks uh, which books can you recommend my kids to read, he's not going to mention of phones and players. So I work very closely. So for me, it's not about the publishing house, it's about the people in the publishing houses. Those are the people that I actually uh, relate. Yeah. So, but my main publishers are Longhorn and Oxford. And indeed, you know, you, 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 one of the things that people particularly noticed of pawns and players was that you guys came up with a brilliant marketing strategy, which I think other people are beginning to say, ah, we can do that. And I think for me, it speaks we, to we did the a trailer. part of it. Do you want to say a little bit about that? Yes. So we did a trailer. I wish we were able to share our screen. We would actually have, have, have showed the, the trailer. But we did a trailer, the book, and it was voiced by, again, my mentor, John Sibiokumu. Uh, it was just a trailer talking about, you know, a trailer about, it was actually, I don't think I've ever seen any other trailer before that, I need a book trailer. And now you can see people, other writers are now starting to have trailers for books, which was like a movie trailer. Uh, and we shared it across, uh, we shared it across, asked people to forward it across WhatsApp. By the time the book was launched, you had more than 600 pre-orders. Uh, and, and, and in Kenya, you know, if you sell a thousand copies in a year, you're a bestseller. So by the time the book was released and the book was sold within, within two weeks, we had sold the first, the, first, uh, the first print run. And it was all because of the video that we sent across. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I can't believe how quick the time has flown. And I want to, I, I'm, oh, I'm yeah. really sorry <laughs> that we will have to come to the end, but I wanted to ask you about, you did mention a little bit about um, what, what, what we can look forward. I know one of the titles is Hocus Pocus, but tell us a little bit. But before we do that, I just wanted to end this quick discussion on, on of pawns and players with something that um, Mercy CBU said, um, publishing on Paukwa. And I was really thrilled to see, even as we were talking about doing this book, a review came up and I said, oh, wow, how wonderful. People are still reading it. And Mercy says, this book is small, but mightily captivating of pawns and players starts off with a bang, pulling us in immediately. The pace builds up to a crescendo that holds an, an unexpected surprise. Though the story tackles some serious themes and topics, Kinyanjui manages to maintain well-paced storytelling made without any undertones of sadness. You might think you know the decisions that would be made by Thomas, only to come to the end of the close of the last chapter and just say, ay, 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 ay. I thought that was such yeah. a great review. What would you like to be your last yeah. words to, to us? Again, again, to us? again, tribute to Wahome Motahi, because that was actually the whole motivation for writing the story was I just want to be like Wahome Motahi. Be simple, have a strong, simple character, and you know, have a strong theme. But don't don't preach. Don't I don't want to preach. So my next story is about uh, it's about uh, a gang of people who get to kidnap a billionaire as part of a Fool's Day prank. So it's called Fool's Day. 
Um, and it's again, I've used the same, same kind of strategy where it's, I'm going for simplicity. It's a bit longer, but I've gone for simplicity. I've gone for uh, strong themes and I've gone for uh, simple characters and then putting some humor there as well. Yeah. I'm saying that would be yes, absolutely, yeah. I really look forward to that because I think, I think, you know, we, I love your writing, as I've said. Thank you very much for sharing it. I do want us to go back uh, to Dr. Ndirangu. And what we're going to do at the end is we're going to give you a chance um, to get a sense of the trailer that uh, Kinyanjui is talking about. So we'll have our final uh, words, our closing words from Dr. Ndirangu, and then we'll leave you with a taste of, of Pawns and Players. Thank you very much, Kinyanjui. It's been such a pleasure talking to you. Thank you. Thank you for having Thank me. You. Always a pleasure, yeah. Dr. Ndirango? Thank you, Mushai. Uh, this is wonderful. I'm sure everyone has really enjoyed this discussion as I have, and we really um, look forward to reading more from uh, Kombani. Um, I would say to our audience, please be on the lookout for our other come, upcoming series events uh, discussing other uh, authors and their work as well as the recording of this particular discussion will be on YouTube, um, you will receive an email alerting you to that. So for now, thank you so much for joining us. Please join us uh, in the future and I'll hand it back to Mshai so that you can conclude with uh, the part that is remaining. Thank you and goodbye. And thank you very much. And now we are going to just share the trailer of, of Pawns and Players. Of pawns and players. It starts with a punch from an old man in a Mercedes. Why is he attacking them? There must be a girl involved. These stories with old men in expensive cars always have a girl involved. Of Pawns and Players, the new novel by Kinyanjui Kombani, coming soon to a bookshop near you. Thank you very much. I hope everybody. the sound was okay now, right? Yes, it was. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Now we look forward to the next conversation, which I think will be coming next year. Thank you. Okay.